Hello, my friends across the fruited and rooted plain. It's time for another edition of the Gardening Simplified Show with me, Rick Feist, and Stacy Hervella. And okay. Stacy, uh, you're so good at plant names. Thanks. Who needs how to pronounce dot com? You know? Is that a site? When you're here? Yeah, it's a website. Oh, that's cool. I use it. <laughs> well, I don't know. have to anymore now that Stacy's <laughs> sitting next to me. Well, you know, there's a, there's a saying that I saw, a little meme type thing that went around a few years ago that I really love. And it says, never make fun of someone who mispronounces a word because it means they learned it by reading. Oh. And you should make fun of people for pronouncing things anyway because that's petty and silly. But uh, well, some people you. do feel self-conscious, but it basically means that you learned it by reading. And that's a very good thing. I'm not self-conscious at all. I'm just having fun. <laughs> and by the way... Gardening is fun, and it's a great time of the year to garden, but if you want to get away, go on vacation, take off for a little while. Of course, a lot of people will use a pet sitter, have someone take care of their pet or pets when they go away, or maybe even their house plant, or ask a neighbor to take out the trash. I think that's pretty common. Definitely. Pretty easy to do. But what about taking care of your garden? Now, there's a lot of pressure there. And how do you find a plant sitter? I think you should look for a friend or somebody whose garden you admire and then try to get them to take care of your garden while you're gone. But you have to be prepared to reciprocate. Absolutely. Right? Yes. Yeah. So um, I don't know. Do you? Well, I'll, I'll be honest. I, tr sitter? I try not to to travel at, <laughs> at really crucial garden times. I'm not even joking. I had a vacation this year, uh, the week before Memorial Day, and it was tough, you know, because I had gone shopping with my mom for annuals earlier in May when we were together for Mother's Day. And so I had all my annuals and um, I wasn't going to, you know, like, what am I going to do? So I, I was like, oh, this is really bad timing. So I did ask my neighbor to water the plants and, and he is very, very good like that. And he did. But, you know, if it's like prime tomato time, you know, I got to be honest, I'm probably not taking a long vacation. What about you? Well, I'll tell you what, I got two words for you. Soaker hoses, <laughs> right? Yes. Soaker hoses. And do you know your neighbors? I mean, it may sound like a silly thing to ask and to say, but I was really, uh, reading a real estate uh, survey and they were talking about the fact that if you're over 40, 40 years old or you're a baby boomer like me, uh, you know your neighbors' names, but if you're younger than 40, um, then you know less of your neighbors' names. I'm not so sure that that is true. I think it's more so we live in a digital age and we interact digitally now, whereas when my kids were young, we were always in the street, in the front yard, interacting with the neighbors, and we were sure to... Uh, know their names, but it's a fascinating thought. Do it you is. know your neighbors? I know all my neighbors, um, but I'm over forty, so <laughs> maybe I'm not <laughs> such a good, uh, a good, uh, you know, judge of that. But we did ask our producer Adriana, who is in her twenties, and she also knows her neighbors. So I think it really depends on um, your neighborhood. Yeah, you know, if you exactly. live in a in a smaller, close knit neighborhood. Uh, people are just more likely to, you know, introduce each other and get to know each other and be more friendly. And, you know, I lived in New York City for 12 years and I didn't really know any of my neighbors. Everyone just really kept to themselves more, even though I had a lot more neighbors. But now I know everybody on my street, first name basis, and we say hello. And I think it's a really lovely thing. So I think we should do our own study because I think it has nothing to do with age. Again, yes, I agree. I think it has to do with the neighborhood. And if you have beautiful flowers growing in your neighborhood, you're going to be more apt to get to know your neighbors. That's my theory, and I'm sticking with it. I think it's a good one because, you know, I do have to, to say my neighbor, Mary Jane, uh, complimented me this year. She said, I love your garden because I get to enjoy it and I don't have to work for it. And I just sit here in my back porch with my binoculars and just watch all the birds play in your flowers. And I just want to thank you. And I'm only too happy to provide that service. Yes, and if you know if you don't want to grow tomatoes or zucchini or cucumbers, it's best to admire your neighbor's garden and tell them about it, and you're apt to pick up a little free produce. Yeah, especially if you help them the water process. their plants when they go on vacation. You Pay you back it. in zucchini. Hey, and speaking of baby boomers, I wanted to ask you, Stacy, if you agree with this. I was reading Royal Horticultural so uh, Society. They had claimed uh, that baby boomers caused a lost 
generation of gardeners. Now, again, as I've said, I've been in this industry for well over 40 years, and I love uh, the new gardeners that have come into our industry, their love for gardening, their enthusiasm. There is a host of uh, new gardeners. And the Royal Horticultural Society, uh, they claimed that we didn't do a very good job as, as baby boomers nurturing gardeners. There was a lost generation there before we picked it up again. And I'm like, hmm. That's interesting. I, now, feel I, bad. I have to say I was raised by baby boomers and I was not raised in a gardening culture whatsoever. My grandparents were gardeners, you know, like they had some things that they always grew every year, but my parents were absolutely positively not gardeners. And so I kind of had to pick that up on myself. And, you know, so I'd say with them, it was reflective. They just didn't really have the interest. And, you know, also like my parents' first house when they were first married, was like a, a small suburban tract, and it didn't really have any landscaping, so it was mm-hmm. just like Golden Privet and Taxus. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, like, what is up with everybody planting Taxus or you? It's one of the most toxic plants out there, and yet it's one of the most common landscaping plants. I mean, I grew up, and my mom was like, do not ever, ever eat the red berries on that plant. Why would you have something right outside your front door like that? I don't get it. <laughs> and for people keeping <laughs> score at home, we're not talking about Texas, T-E-X-A-S. Thank you. A-S. We're talking about, did I spell that right? T-E-X-A-S? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay. <laughs> Whew. Whew. Tech, tax us, T-A-X-U-S, the U's, Y-E-W-S. And I'm just going to move along before I dig myself <laughs> any deeper. Stacy, do you pull the roots apart when you remove a plant from a container, like those distinctive white proven winter pots, people will often ask, okay, I'm planting, fall is for planting. Do I tear the roots apart? A hundred percent I do. You yes, do? I always do. And um, it's not, so, I mean, if you don't do it, it's probably not the end of the world. But yeah, what happens, I mean, a, a plant container, of course, is cylindrical. And as shrubs, especially, and certainly perennials, this happens as well, as they've grown in those containers, the roots start to circle and create a, a really distinctive, uh, thick kind of circular armor of roots around mm-hmm. the outer edge of the of the inside of the container. And, um, you know, it's not likely to probably what they call girdle the plant or like kind of choke it out at the base. But um, it does, it, it can kind of just keep it from, from rooting out into the site. So I think it's always a good idea to pull those apart now. This is definitely a case, I'm sure you know, Rick, of easier said than done. Some plants are much easier to pull apart, and some are very difficult. If you've ever tried to do it with an ornamental grass, for example, Um, if I'm planting an ornamental grass and it's really root-bound like that, I'll just take my pruners and make several slices. But the goal is to create branching within the roots so that they will kind of let go from that memory of the container and uh, branch out and grow into the fresh soil that you've planted it in and get established. That's a good way to put it. Memory of that container. Well, I can't take credit for that. That was Laura from Garden Answer. She calls it, I think she calls it root memory. That's really good. That's really good. I've uh, I've gotten into the habit of digging square holes oh, you have. instead of round holes. And again, my theory is uh, it helps the roots seek out and penetrate into the soil as opposed to that, yes, that circular pattern uh, that sometimes uh, we can get. Can you actually dig a square hole in our sandy soil? I can. Okay. <laughs> For me, it's kind of more of a quicksand type of uh, race <laughs> against time. The, the sand's back filling and I'm trying to get the plant in us there. Us lakeshore <laughs> gardeners, yes. So word of the day real quickly here, decumbent. Ooh. Decumbent. I like that word. Decumbent. No, this is not a a political word. Someone running for office. So and so is the decumbent. But uh, we're going to talk about a decumbent plant coming up because for those who are watching us on YouTube, Stacy, am I correct that it's a plant that does this? That is correct. It does and this. Our so radio we- <laughs> listeners are going crazy right now. <laughs> yeah, they did. They missed the hand gesture. <laughs> so we're going to talk about decumbent. That's our word of the day. As a matter of fact, Stacy, let's have you dig into that in our next segment as we put yet another plant on trial. You're tuned in to the Gardening Simplified Show with Stacy Hervella and Rick Weiss. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.
Greetings, gardeners, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. I'm Stacy Hervella, and I'm joined here in the Proven Winners Color Choice Shrub Studio with Rick Feist, and it is time to put a plant on trial. I love these plant trials. And you know what I really like is uh, last episode and this episode, I have tied them in, my choice of the plant on trial, to your word of the day. I like that, and it almost feels like I'm the jury here, <laughs> not the judge, We'll let our listeners be the judge, but I'm the jury, and you're trying to convince me that this plant should be in my landscape. All right. Well, I think I'm going to be able to do that because the plant that is on trial today is low-scape mound aronia. And I picked this for a couple of reasons, but the way it relates back to the word of the day that you hinted at at the end of the last uh, segment is it is it has decumbent growth. Decumbent growth. And okay, so now we need to explain this for our listeners, especially our radio sh uh, show listeners who are unable to look at our <laughs> hand gestures, because as I understand it, Stacy, there's also a procumbent mm -hmm. and a decumbent. Correct. Help me, please. Sure. So uh, decumbent growth is basically a, a stem uh, that grows along the ground, and then when it gets ready to grow up, it grows upward. So uh, procumbent growth grows laterally and then droops down. So okay. decumbent grows laterally and then points up. Procumbent growth grows laterally and then grows down. So a good example of a procumbent growth would be our uh, lo and behold purple haze butterfly bush. So I don't know if that's one you're familiar with. Yes. But uh, most butterfly bushes, the flowers kind of stick up with lo and behold purple haze. It has these big flowers that point down and a procumbent habit. Um, but low scape mound aronia is a ground covering aronia that puts woody stems out along the ground and then they reach a certain point and then that points upward and grows leaves and flowers and fruit and so forth. So it's a good example, a real life example of a decumbent growth. But what that means to you as a person who would potentially plant a low scape mound aronia is that it covers the ground, outcompetes weeds, and still looks great doing it. So um, in addition to its decumbent growth habit, I also chose Low Skate Mound Aronia uh, for today's show, for today's Plants on Trial, because it has a fabulous fall color. Mm. Uh, really nice blazing red, orange, yellow tones of fall color. And that's just one reason to grow it, because really it's a, a fascinating plant with multiple seasons of interest. It's a native shrub. Okay. Uh, so it is a, a selection of our native Aronia melanocarpa. And melanocarpa literally translates to black fruit, okay. which uh, this Aronia does indeed have. And if you were to be hiking in the woods, and Aronia grows naturally over the entire eastern half of the U.S. and Canada. If you were to be hiking in the woods and see an Aronia, it would look probably not super great. It would be kind of a scraggly, rangy, large plant, quite open and probably not something that you would look at and say, hey, I can see that in my landscape. Meanwhile, low scape mound aronia was selected by a very talented breeder by the name of Dr. Mark Brand at the University of Connecticut. And he was he was selecting specifically for unique forms of aronia. And low scape mound, much like its name suggests, naturally grows as a little mound shaped plant. So unlike the natural aronia, which is going to be like four to eight feet tall, this is just a little mound of about two feet tall and two feet wide. And it's an extremely useful, very durable plant. So last week we talked about Tortuga juniper and I talked about how durable that was. And it is very durable. But honestly, um, low scape mound does it several better by tolerating pretty much anything you can throw at it. Name a landscape challenge and low scape mound aronia can probably rise to meet it. You got one? There's a lot of people who could use this plant in their landscape because I think it's going to help with weeds also with its low growing habit. And for people who are keeping score at home, uh, just real quickly, aronia, so that's A-R-O-N-I-A, -A, pretty simple. And I'm sure Stacy will put uh, this plant in our show notes at gardening simplified on air.com. Stacy, I need to ask you before we go further, the common name for the plant is chokeberry, right? Lovely name, right? Chokeberry. <laughs> and it being a name and and it's and it's interesting to me because they didn't name the plant this berry tastes bad berry or this is awful berry or this is I mean, they call it choke. Yeah. Berry. 
That gives you an idea of you can eat the berries and they're actually quite healthy Extremely. for you from what I read, but you're going to have a tough time choking them down. Uh, yeah, so chokeberry is a, maybe a little bit of an exaggeration and not a very pretty word. And that's why I choose to call it aronia. It's much nicer to say. Um, but yeah, so it is absolutely edible. You'll often see aronia, aronia juice listed as an ingredient in like healthy drinks that you buy at like health food stores, the expensive drinks in short, mm -hmm. um, full of vitamins and minerals. But if you were to take a berry off, a ripe berry off an aronia, and God forbid you take an unripe berry, it has the effect of just sucking all the moisture out of your mouth. Have you ever had something like that? Oh. Just extremely, extremely astringent and just kind of like... Astringent is the <laughs> word I was looking for. And to describe a berry as astringent makes me want to go... Uh, no thanks. I'll pass. <laughs> you know, I should have gone out and, and brought some in from the trial garden because the Ooh. berries on Lowscape Mound uh, and Lowscape Snowfire Aronia in our trial gardens are ripening. And, you know, I, I've eaten them. I, I ate them a few weeks ago. I mean, not like I'm going to make a, you know, Sunday out of them or something like that, but they are fun to taste. They actually have a good flavor. It's just that they have that effect of just puckering your lips because they take all the moisture out. So hence the name Chokeberry. And that's why we don't use it. Not poisonous at all, but just not yeah. very pretty. And when your neighbors say, oh my gosh, what is that beautiful plant covered in the white flowers in spring? Do you really want to answer them? Oh, that's a chokeberry. No, you want to say, oh, that's an aronia. You'll sound much, much, more, much more sophisticated. Aronia. Yes. So, uh, uh, so like I said, it is covered in white flowers in spring. Now, I tend to um, get very obsessive about little details with plants. And one of the things I love about Low Skate Mound Aronia the flowers have pink pollen. Mm. And that might sound like something that's a very minor detail that you wouldn't notice, but it actually makes quite a distinctive difference when the plant is in flower because it really shines out. That bright pink pollen really shines out from the center. So it doesn't just look like a plain white plant. It almost looks like it has a two-toned effect. Yeah, and if you're looking for an area in your yard where you don't want to grow lawn, we've talked about this before on the show, and you want to kind of fill in an area that ground hugging effect and the fact that it has good maintenance qualities in summer but is pretty in spring with the flowers and as you mentioned Stacy the fall color gorgeous and you know what there's another great feature that it has and that's the berries so uh, I those... was avoiding the berries <laughs> but the berries are really quite attractive so they're yes, a dark purple pretty. black yes very distinctive and if you do not wish to eat your aronia berries, no problem whatsoever. The birds and opossums and other animals will be more than happy to take care of them for you. Uh, so you don't have to worry about them. They're not going to like fall on your car or something like that and make a big mess like a mulberry might. Um, but they're, they're really quite a nice feature and um, good for attracting wildlife. Now, that does kind of bring up the question of deer. And aronia is kind of a funny, in a funny position when it comes to deer resistance. So it's definitely not rabbit resistance. I have had it in my garden before, and the rabbits have neatly chopped off every single flower. Oh, boy. Um, so good for them. I guess they were hungry. Uh, but that does... So to say it's rabbit proof, it, that would be erroneous. Oh, yes. Right? That would be extremely erroneous. You may use that name. one sometime Thank if you. you'd like. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, and if the rabbits eat the flowers, then you're not going to get fruit because the fruit, of course, develops from the flowers. But if your erronea does develop fruit, uh, you will see erronea melanocarpa on lists uh, for landowners to plant to manage specifically for attracting deer for hunting uh, because they do love the berries. So it is just something to keep in mind. They won't severely damage the plant, but they will probably be attracted to the flowers if the rabbits haven't already eaten them and then the berries if they do form. So worth remembering. But even if you grow it and you have deer, you're still going to get a super durable plant that has really good fall color. So it's kind of a trade-off if you just need something very, very low maintenance. Now, one last thing I do want to say before we take a break. On Aronia, we were talking about pulling apart the, uh, the roots this is one that you are going to definitely want to pull apart the roots on. When you take a low skate mound aronia out of the white proven winner's container, its roots are just going to be all circled up in there. So you're going to want to try to break it apart the best that you can uh, and help it get established and spread its uh, spread its roots. And it will start looking a lot better for you a lot sooner. So that is low scape mound aronia in a nutshell. Ask for it at your favorite local garden center in the distinctive white proven winners container. We have to take a quick break, but when we come back, it is going to be time to open the gardener's mailbag and answer all your questions. So don't miss it. 
Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. I'm Stacey Hervella, and I'm here with Rick Weiss, and we are about to open up the Gardener's Mailbag, but before we do, we want to open up the opportunity to you, our listeners, to ask us your gardening questions. It is one of the purposes and our truly uh, truly realized goals for this show is to help you out and ask, answer your gardening questions. So all you have to do is go to gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. You can click on the Contact Us form, or you can actually just email us directly at help, H-E-L-P, at gardeningsimplified.com. And while you are on our website, you can also see the show notes for every single show where we give you more information about the plants that we talk about. We put down the resources for the questions that we answer, links to all of our branching news segments. So it's a great resource and keeps you from having to try to write things down while you're listening to the show, especially if you're driving, because that's really never a good idea. Yeah, not a good idea. And of course, questions, but also comments, uh, share comments, because when you share comments or ideas or thoughts from your garden too, uh, we'd love to comment on them. And when we share them with others, well, we all benefit. And that's part of the Reason for doing the Gardening Simplified show. Let's get into the mailbag, uh, Stacy And Karen's writing to us, I would like to plant a lilac bush. I'm in zone 6A here in Ohio. I lost a new one and don't know what happened to it, but I'd like to get a replacement in the ground as soon as I can. Should I wait until spring or plant a new lilac now? So great question, Karen. And, you know, it's early October still. And generally speaking, you want to aim to have your fall planting done about six weeks before the ground freezes. Now, that's a, a, a moving target, of course. Mm-hmm. You can never really predict when the ground is going to freeze and that, that deadline is going to hit. But, you know, for most of like zone five and six, I would say you can safely plant through at least mid-October, if not, you know, a little bit later. And, you, you know, that's, again, that's just kind of a general rule. So the, the first answer, Karen, to your question is yes, it's absolutely a great time to plant a lilac, but... One thing I wanted to address specifically with lilacs, their biggest enemy is not cold. Lilacs are actually extremely, extremely hardy. And a lot of people don't realize that they're not just cold tolerant. They actually need cold. Yes. If lilacs don't get enough cold, they won't flower. And, you know, uh, sometimes when I have zone envy, and I'm thinking about all of those California gardeners who have their fabulous lemon trees and jasmine and all those things I'm jealous of, that they can't grow lilacs. And if I had a dollar for every person from a warm climate who wrote me saying, can I grow lilacs? Please say the answer is yes. I would be I would be rich enough to buy a garden uh-huh. in California. But here I am in Michigan growing lilacs because they are so hardy. But one thing that can severely harm a lilac is wet soil. If, there, if, if lilacs have one cultural enemy out there in the horticulture world, it is definitely wet soil. So while it's t- it's t- it's fine time-wise to plant your lilac now, I would, if your soil is very wet, I would advise you to wait until spring because what that's going to do is give the plant a lot more time to create a root system that will help it withstand any of those stresses that do come out. So Karen, you know what your soil is like the best. You know, if you have like a wet or low spots that stay wet, particularly a long time in the spring, because that's where the danger zone really is. If you have that kind of area, I would wait until spring. That way it can put on more roots. But if you don't and you have good drainage, by all means, plant your lilac now and you'll be able to enjoy it even more next spring. To uh, to create an offshoot of, of what Karen wrote us, uh, I do want to mention, Stacy. I do think it's a good time of the year to move a plant. You know, if, if there's a plant that's been in your way or it's been driving you crazy, but I want to move this plant. It needs a new, you know, some of the plants in my landscape have been moved so many times they're eligible for frequent flyer miles. They truly are. And, but that's because I like, you know, moving things around, right? Yeah. And what a great time of the year because there's less stress on the plants. We could prune them back, less stress, and we could move them. So if you have a plant or a lilac or something that you need to move, my personal opinion, Stacy, good time of the year to do it. I'm 100% with you. I have to ask you a quick question. Yeah. Does it drive your wife crazy that you move your plants around? I uh, No. Okay. I just... You just do it. She does. I just do it move them around and then have some fun and then change my mind again next year. Yeah. So my husband does not love my, my, uh, habit of moving plants around. He says, you never give it a chance to settle in. And I say, 
you know, the garden is an ongoing audition for, yeah. for starring roles. So a yeah. little bit of a bone of contention there, but I agree. I, I move things around all the time because you know what? You don't have to get it right the first time. In uh, I mean, unless you're planting like an oak tree, but. In grade school, I didn't color between the lines. Does that surprise you? Not one bit. Thank you. Okay, next question. Krista writes to us, I currently have a pinky winky hydrangea that attracts a lot of bees near my front door, so I'm going to move it. I'd like to replace it with another hydrangea that does not attract bees and is not so large. What would you recommend? By the way, before you answer that, uh, Stacy, I do want to mention Pinky Winky is a favorite of mine. What a what a performer in the landscape. It is an outstanding plant and a classic. It's mm-hmm. been around for a long time. And yep. we actually, just this year, uh, are introducing Pinky Winky Prime. So an improved Pinky Winky with um, more full flowers and really brighter color. So Pinky Winky does get fabulous pink color as the season progresses. Pinky Winky Prime is practically glowing fluorescent, so that'll be on the market next year. Uh, But in the meantime, I wanted to address Krista's, Krista's question because it's a great one. And the reason that Pinky Winky attracts so many bees is because it's a lace cap hydrangea. It's a panicle hydrangea, very hardy and easy to grow, But it is a lace cap. And what that means is that uh, it has a high percentage of fertile florets Mm -hmm. that um, actually contain the nectar and pollen and all of the things that attract pollinators like bees. It has a lower percentage of sterile florets, which are the the really showy ones that look like, you know, the classic flower that you would draw. I call them landing pads, though. Oh, that's a good name for them. Yeah, they serve well as a landing pad for the pollinators. And that's what they're supposed to do is just say, hey, pollinators, look here. I got pollen, but I tricked you because I didn't have to put a lot of energy into making these big flowers. There's only a few of them, and now you're here, and you're going to eat. Free parking. Um, So lace cap hydrangeas tend to attract pollinators, and mop heads don't. Not because they don't have pollen, but because those fertile florets that have the pollen and nectar are obscured by the landing pads there you go. or sterile florets. So, Krista, you can absolutely replace it with another panicle hydrangea. You're just going to want to look for one that is not a lace cap. So, you also said you wanted something smaller. So, a couple of good choices would be little lime punch hydrangea, little lime hydrangea, bobo hydrangea, little quick fire hydrangea, which is uh, actually, to scratch that, little quick fire is a, a lace cap. So, don't don't take that one out. But again, we'll list this all in the show notes so you can refer back to that. But those are three fabulous choices that you'll be able to plant um, and mitigate your bee problems so that when your your post office person or your guests come over, they don't have to be, you know, running in fright from all the bees storming your pinky winky. It's all the buzz. Okay, Susie writes to us, what's the best hydrangea for shade and can you grow hydrangeas in shade? And I've had a lot of success growing hydrangeas on the north side of my house. Yeah, so, you know, hydrangeas are traditionally considered a shade plant, and that's not necessarily wrong, but what a lot of people don't realize is that they do benefit from some sun. Uh, you know, they're definitely, particularly when it comes to a smooth or Annabelle-type hydrangea or a panicle hydrangea, like we were just talking about with Pinky Winky, um, They definitely, you're going to see stronger uh, stems, bigger flowers, better color if they get at least some sun. But in terms of, in my opinion, the single best type of hydrangea for shade in the north here is an oak leaf hydrangea. Yeah. Um, Oak leaf hydrangeas do very well in shade. You're still going to get nice flowers. You're still going to get nice color. I think they look very at home Mm -hmm. in shade because they are naturally native to woodland areas. Now, if you live in a warmer climate in the south, Pretty much all hydrangeas are shade plants. You're definitely going to want to keep them away from that hot afternoon sun because they're just going to wilt and not do great. So, uh, Susie, please do look out for an oak leaf hydrangea. We have some fabulous ones in the Gatsby series. You can read about those in the show notes. And, uh, yeah, I think that that's going to be a great choice for you. So uh, we have come to the end of the Gardener's Mailbag for this week, but I would invite you again, if you have a question, don't hesitate to reach out to us, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. We're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to be back with Rick's branching news, and you won't want to miss that, so please stay tuned. Welcome back to the Gardening Simplified show with Stacy Hervella and me, Rick Weist. And want to remind folks, look for the Gardening Simplified show on YouTube. Yes. I kind of enjoy watching it. It's kind of fun. It's a kick in the plant. So look for it on YouTube. And by the way, for those who are watching on YouTube, we talked earlier about the fact that I dig square holes as opposed to round holes so I don't get that 
circulation of the roots. And I just realized I'm drinking from a square mug. I thought you meant to do that. Well, yeah, I did because it's one of my favorites. Here, I'll show it to our YouTube viewers. Uh, It's got beautiful ginkgo leaves on it, and you can't go wrong with the ginkgo. Because ginkgo is one of my favorite trees. And I love the fact in fall when those leaves turn yellow, uh, at least any ginkgo I've ever owned, uh, they all fall on the same day pretty much. And so you just got to guess what day it's going to be. You can go to work in the morning. It's a gorgeous yellow tree, and you come home from work, and they're all just... Sitting in a pile at the base. You have a beautiful yellow carpet. Did you know that we have a new uh, ginkgo in the Proven Winners Color Choice line? I did not know. Please tell me a moment. Okay. It is a fastidget ginkgo, so that means it grows straight up and down, and I think you're going to like the name. It's called Skinny Fit. Mm. (laughs) Skinny Fit Ginkgo. Yes. So Very not good. on the market just yet. So that's a little sneak preview, but um, I, thought I it was, hope it works out. I thought, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know what's worse. The joke itself or that I didn't see it coming. <laughs> can I get to branching news? Yes, you sure can. Thank Please you do. for that plug too. That's wonderful. Okay. So branching news, <laughs> ever lose a pruning shears or garden gloves in your yard only to find them next season? Yes. Yeah, me too. All the time. Uh, There's a town in Iowa. They lost their time capsule as its centerpiece to a 150-year anniversary small northwest Iowa city of Sheldon planned to make the opening of a time capsule one of the centerpiece events of its 150th anniversary this weekend, but they ran into a slight problem. No one knows where the time capsule is. Oh, no. That's a problem. Uh, they waited 150 years and now they can't find it? They waited 50 years. Oh, 50 years. Okay. Yeah. So the centennial celebration, I guess, gotcha. they stuck this time capsule in the ground and now the birthday cake is ready and the coffee and everything else, but they can't find the uh, the time capsule. Well, I, so. I would hope someone's still alive who maybe vaguely remembers uh, where where they buried it. And that's the problem. Everyone says vaguely. <laughs> so are they going to tear up the whole town? It's like the astronaut who says, you want to come out of the capsule and do a spacewalk with me? No pressure. (laughs) Okay, move on. This is the time of year we plant flower bulbs, right? Thanks to our friends in the Netherlands. Yes, definitely. I love planting bulbs. And by the way, when it comes to fall bulbs, a favorite of mine are the alliums. I just love the alliums. And the deer leave them alone. I have boatloads of alliums. And you know what? They self-sow for me in a very pleasant way. So they grow by seed. Mm -hmm. And over time, I get more and more alliums, and I absolutely love that. Well, the Netherlands, or Holland, is uh, inextricably linked to the sea, dikes and dunes, and almost a third of the Netherlands is situated below sea level. Anyhow, I found it interesting because we've been talking about drought and water problems, not only in the U.S., but uh, across the world, and I guess they have the same problem in the Netherlands. Who would think that water would be a problem in the Netherlands? Uh, Water companies in the Netherlands said a combination of drought, pollution, and the growing population is a threat to the supply of clean water in the country. Wow. The water system reaching its limits due to drought, salinity, and increasing water demand. That is not Got, well, there's so much horticulture in the Netherlands that that's not good for cut flowers or yeah. bulbs or uh, a number of things. Oh, the agriculture industry there, uh, just super, super important. So I have to keep an eye on that. Yes. Well, fortunately, bulbs don't need a lot of water. Right. <laughs> they need to actually be quite dry this time of year. So that's uh, true. it would be a great time of year to get some bulbs, go to your local store, order them online, whatever you need to do. But, you know, the thing about bulbs People are like, I planted 25 bulbs. And I'm like, amateur. You know, the thing is, you got to plant a lot of bulbs. You got to plant a lot of bulbs for a a good display. And you don't have to dig an individual hole for each one. I dig one hole and I put a lot of bulbs in it. And the display is is wonderful. I tend to plant a lot of bulbs too. Although I have often planted bulbs in December with a pickaxe. Because at that point, uh, you know, the bulbs are on clearance. and Got to take advantage of those They're just like me, half off. and. I can put them in the ground and save money. And <laughs> hey, I, you know, I cannot resist a clearance bulb myself. Same so here. I feel you. Yeah, exactly. All right. So anyhow, that's the uh, that's the deal in Holland. And wouldn't you like to know what happens next? The next news item is sleep tech company Emma Sleep. Now this is cool. In the UK, they're opening up what they call a sleep sanctuary. In 2023, in other words, you can go out in a field, they put you in this little dome, this sleep dome, it hosts 
two guests and features a luxurious double bed with views of uh, the, the gorgeous surroundings and, of course, sheep. And you can count sheep as you drift off blissfully to sleep, tucked in after a nice dinner, settled in for the night, and the next morning wake up to a guided yoga session and breakfast with locally sourced food. So, wow. I think we need a gardening simplified field trip. That would be, I, I would like to do that. It sounds wonderful. Hopefully it's not too expensive or you'd get fleeced, but regardless... <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was a sheep shot. <laughs> that really was. That was bad. Uh, I knew that one yeah, was coming. Okay, next news item, Washington Post. Okay, this is something I wanted to cover because I'm fascinated by this. I love fall. And don't you love it when you drive through a neighborhood and there's a canopy of trees? Isn't that just heartwarming? Or you're coming home from work and your street, the trees are in color, some of them drifting... Isn't it great? It is. It's it's one of the true highlights of fall. Americana. It is just, I love that. And the Washington Post had a story on street names. So over uh, out, out of over a million roads in the United States, 9,640 of them were named Park. Mm -hmm. So I guess Park is a big one. I guess so. And next on the list would be Second Street. And then you would say, well, why 2nd Street? Why not 1st Street? And first thought. Yeah, your first thought. <laughs> well done. Uh, but the problem here is for many cities, they don't have a 1st Street. It's considered Main Street. Oh, and that makes that's sense. That's why 2nd. Yeah, see? So that's, uh, that's pretty interesting. But what we're driving at here on the Gardening Simplified show is that trees are very important when it comes to naming Streets, basically trees, numbers, and presidents are the most popular names for streets, which is, uh, which is understandable, I guess, I guess. I have always said that in suburbia, in, in the suburbs, it's a place where we cut down the trees and then name the streets after them, right? Yes. Yeah. But uh, Magnolia and Dogwood are street names that are popular in the south, while Maple is popular in the north, and then the two oak states are Oklahoma and Arkansas. Of course, Oklahoma, right? Yes. So those are the two oak states. Now, Michigan and Pennsylvania, top uh, street, Maple. Huh. Maple, whereas Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, New York, surrounding those states, it's park. So in, in Michigan, where, where we live, Stacy, and where our radio show listeners, uh, many are listening, it's Maple Park, Lake Pine, Oak Cedar, Second, Lake View, First, and Birch. Hmm, interesting. Well, uh, I, I think that you can find all of those out here on the lakeshore, at least yes. in the Grand Haven area and probably in, in the Holland area too. So uh, I guess that just means we're, we're predictable. Lots of lake views. So we'll put that list uh, there also on the website and make sure to look for the show notes. Stacy, we want to inv invite folks to, uh, to visit our website. Yeah, you know, we really want it to be simple. If you heard something interesting for you to get back there and find out more information and dive deeper. So after every show, we put down all of our notes and you can uh, go there and read everything and catch up and explore all of these uh, branching news items yourself. Tell your friends and neighbors, have them tune in also. And, of course, look for Gardening Simplified Show on YouTube, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. A big thank you very much to Adriana. You're amazing. You do great work. And John Ilk, back in the studio. Much appreciated. You bet. Thank you, Stacy. Always a pleasure and privilege. And I... I took it easy on the puns today. I you did. did. It was a, it was, off a little. It was a little lacking. I, I'm sure you'll be roaring back next week, right? Have yourself a great week. And again, make sure to tell your friends and neighbors about the Gardening Simplified Show. Take care.